G'day, I'm Dr. Paul Mason. It's conventional wisdom that you can neither prevent nor treat dementia. Well, I'm here to tell you that is wrong. Your lifestyle, and most specifically your diet, plays a huge role in determining whether you will one day be diagnosed with dementia. And this includes if you happen to carry the ApoE4 Alzheimer's gene. The following is a short clip from one of my longer lectures looking at the compelling science that indeed billions of dollars have been wasted on drug research when we should have been looking at nutrition all along. I'd like to now look at the role of seed oils and sugar in causing a condition that invokes more fear than even cancer, and that's dementia. Despite decades of research costing billions of dollars, we're no closer to a cure for dementia than we were when Alzheimer's disease was first described more than 100 years ago. The frustrating thing is that had only a tiny amount of this money been directed at nutritional research, I believe we would be in a much, much better place today. And that's because, for the most part, dementia can be considered a metabolic disease of the brain. And the vulnerability of the brain to metabolic disease is obvious. While it constitutes only 2% of the body's volume, it consumes over 20% of its energy. In fact, dementia is now commonly referred to as type 3 diabetes. And the same health impacts associated with type 2 diabetes are also associated with dementia. Take obesity, for example. This study looked at abdominal obesity in over 6,500 subjects. And over 30 years, they found that obesity was significantly correlated with the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease three times the risk, in fact, when comparing the leanest and the most overweight individuals. And several studies have now convincingly demonstrated that obesity is associated with reduced brain volume. Obesity quite literally shrinks your brain. And insulin resistance, common in metabolic disease, is apparent in the brains of those with Alzheimer's disease. This scan here is called a PET scan, where glucose uptake by brain cells is indicated on a heat map. You can see that a normal brain is able to take in large amounts of glucose, much of it through the action of insulin, which permits its entry into brain cells. Contrast this to the Alzheimer's brain on the right, where insulin is not working properly. And you can see that despite having elevated levels of glucose in the bloodstream, the glucose is impaired in entering brain cells. The brain is effectively being starved of energy and this is one of the reasons for the cognitive impairment we see in Alzheimer's disease. Let's now compare how a brain affected by insulin resistance and Alzheimer's disease can utilise ketones, which can be produced on a ketogenic diet, as a result of fat metabolism. Here on the left you can see that Alzheimer's disease affected brain is unable to utilise significant amounts of glucose for energy. But when the same brain is supplied with ketones, it just sucks them up. Providing ketones to the energy-starved, demented brain bypasses the block caused by insulin resistance and improves neuronal function. And have no doubt about the ability of low-carbohydrate ketogenic diets to provide ketones to fuel the brain. Here you can see negligible uptake of ketones in a brain in someone on a high-carb diet. And the very same brain on a low-carb ketogenic diet, massive uptake. It's therefore logical that ketogenic diets would improve the energy supply to insulin-resistant brain neurons, improving brain function. And that's exactly what the research shows. This recent study demonstrated a significant enhancement of brain activity in elderly adults after commencing a ketogenic diet. And make no mistake, these benefits are not seen on low-fat diets. The same study also included a high carbohydrate arm following a diet recommended by the American Heart Association with a resounding lack of benefit. So it's very clear ketones can be absolutely beneficial in improving cognitive function in those suffering from dementia. But I'm going to take it a step further. I also believe that a healthy diet low in sugar and seed oils can help prevent Alzheimer's disease in the first place. If we look at a brain affected by Alzheimer's disease under a microscope, we'll see these clumps of protein known as beta amyloid plaques. 
and these are thought to be toxic to our brain neurons and lead to much of the damage in Alzheimer's disease. And we've now got imaging techniques where we can visualize these toxic plaques, compare this healthy brain with relatively little beta amyloid deposited to the brain of an Alzheimer's disease patient. The interesting thing is that the formation of these beta amyloid plaques can be strongly influenced by our diet. Beta amyloid plaques are aggregates of these single beta amyloid peptides. But these peptides don't just clump together out of the box. We have to damage them first. First, we add sugar, which then covalently binds to these beta amyloid peptides, producing something called an early glycation product. This then makes the beta amyloid peptides vulnerable to clumping. These early glycation products can then progress to advanced glycated end products, which are essentially the beta amyloid plaques. And understand that this final step is strongly driven by oxidative stress. The same stress we experience when we consume oxidized seed oils or have unstable, fluctuating blood glucose levels. And again, remember the combination of both poor sugar control and oxidized oil consumption multiplies. It's especially toxic. This is the amount of oxidation products absorbed in study subjects with good blood sugar controls. And this was what was absorbed in subjects with poor blood sugar levels. If you ever needed a reason to avoid processed foods containing both sugar and seed oils, avoiding dementia would have to be it. We also have a natural mechanism in our body to remove beta amyloid plaques. And not only can poor metabolic health increase the deposition of these plaques in the first place, it can also interfere with their removal. HDL cholesterol particles in our brain, through this ApoE protein embedded in their membrane, is able to remove some beta amyloid deposits. The problem is, these ApoE proteins themselves can be damaged, preventing effective removal of the plaques. We also have genetic factors that can increase the chance that our HDL particles get damaged. You see, we have slight variations in the genes that code for these ApoE proteins, and some are much more susceptible to damage from sugar and oxidation than others. The two most common variations are ApoE3 and ApoE4, and this is the one that is especially vulnerable because of its specific molecular structure. This paper here shows the amount of sugar and oxidation damage to ApoE3 compared to ApoE4, for the same exposure, the E4 variant had three times the damage, and this damage will prevent HDL from effectively removing beta amyloid plaques, increasing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And this is why that people with two of these ApoE4 genes are probably about five times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. But I would argue that understanding this mechanism also gives us hope. For even if you happen to carry two of these E4 genes, we know the problem is related to glycation damage, which can be effectively managed by controlling the amount of sugar and seed oil in our diet. For proof of this, let's look at this clever study. Now, the investigators of this study had recognised that while those with the ApoE4 gene did have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, not everyone with the gene developed Alzheimer's. So they set about investigating the impact of environment. Study subjects were recruited from an African population in a single city in Nigeria and African Americans from Indianapolis in the United States. The two study populations, as a result of the slave trade, were ethnically similar, both with very high carrier rates of the ApoE4 gene. And the findings were that the rate of Alzheimer's disease in the Nigerian population was two and a half times less than their genetically identical US counterparts. In my mind, a likely result of the high rate of metabolic disease in the US, and strong evidence that environmental factors play at least a significant role as genetics when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. And for the final word on diet and dementia, we have this recent paper which provided evidence that low-carbohydrate diets may not only prevent brain deterioration, 
they can even reverse existing damage. And evidence for this was found in just the space of one week. In this arm of the study, subjects were fed a standard diet for a period of one week, after which they had a brain scan to assess for network instability, which is a rel reliable marker for brain ageing or deterioration. The same subjects were also given a ketogenic diet for one week with the same brain scan following, the result being that there was significantly less damage to neural pathways. Essentially, damage to neural pathways accelerated whenever the brain was reliant on glucose for energy and reduced when ketones were metabolised, yet more evidence of the benefit of ketogenic diets for brain health. So you can see, there's compelling evidence that not only can ketogenic diets improve the lives of those who already have dementia, but it's even possible to reduce the risk of developing it in the first place. And there are three key factors in doing this. First of all, make sure your diet is nutritionally complete. This means consuming foods which contain nutrients like B12, iron and zinc, all essential for brain health. Secondly, avoid polyunsaturated vegetable and seed oils like sunflower, canola, rice bran and soybean. And finally, avoid excessive fructose intake. For most people, this means assuming the added sugars usually hidden in processed foods. And may you live well and live long.